Well, we are in session five of the book of 1 Kings, and we'll be dealing with chapters 12, 13, and 14. And uh, just to, by way of review, as we go here, you know, Solomon uh, was a king that started off well, but had some problems. Personally, he was brilliant, but he lacked moral vigor because he doesn't go finish the distance. Finishing well is perhaps something that we should each remind ourselves of. He was excessively self-indulgent. And uh, historically, he, did, he, he brought Israel to its peak. And the visit of Queen of Sheba demonstrated that, Solomon in all his glory, and so forth. And typically, Solomon, uh, the positive side, it might point in some respects to the millennial reign, but there are some hidden negatives. Not only his apostasy near the end of his age, but the 666 and so forth. But the zenith of the kingdom is what we've just come from then where he had, uh, they had, from the Mediterranean to the Euphrates, from the Red Sea uh, and Arabia to Lebanon, and uh, the tributary states around there held in subjection, and the Canaanites themselves became peaceably subjects or useful servants, and, and uh, the immense treasures won by David were, uh, were, however, supplanted with oppressive taxation that's going to come home to roost. So Solomon's failure is going to, the shadow of his failure is going to hang over the book of 1 Kings. Um, you know, there were three major sins. Uh, Deuteronomy 17 says that Israel's king should not multiply wealth, horses, or wives. And he did all three. He traded in, in chariots and horses, he indulged in foreign wives, and he introduced false gods and false worship. So his self-life had full swing, and we see that uh, commented on him by himself in, in the book of Ecclesiastes, where he concludes all his vanity that's under the sun and not of the Lord. So anyway, his apostasy is going to be part of the theme that's going to run through the, the number of these chapters. His excessive taxation, alienated people. He was led astray by wives. I know that doesn't happen to any of us here, but I just know it, it's a matter of record there. And uh, they, they made temples to the various gods of the, uh, of the region. And uh, his adversaries stir up rebellion. In fact, we'll see that Ephraim, the, major, the strongest tribe in the north, be, is, becomes the center of the disaffection. God warned him in, uh, in uh, chapter 11, Wherefore the Lord said to Solomon, For as much as this is done of thee, thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee, and will give it to thy servant. And that's exactly what... And this is going to echo through virtually all the kings, with just a few exceptions, um, as we go forward, the same, the same issue. But he doesn't, uh, to, the, to the southern kingdom, there's a couple of good footnotes here. He says, Notwithstanding in thy days, I will not do it for David thy father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of thy son. Howbeit, I will not rend away all the kingdom, but will give one tribe to thy son uh, for David thy servant's sake, for Jerusalem's sake, which I have chosen. And so we're going to see that exception take place. So we're going to jump in now. That was all sort of a quick snapshot of the past. We're now in 1 Kings chapter 12, where the kingdom divides. Chapter 12, verse 1. And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel came, were come to Shechem to make him king. And uh, Shechem, of course, is a, is a uh, uh, fitting place, in a sense, for the coronation of Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. Um, he's, uh, he's the only son that was mentioned in Scripture, at least, and uh, he was certainly appointed by his father to succeed him. Uh, Shechem was where Jehovah first appeared to Abraham in uh, and promised to give him all of Canaan. That was in Genesis chapter 12, where Abram's called. Uh, Jacob later settled there in, in uh, Genesis 33. Joseph was buried there. It's a very prominent place in Scripture. In fact, it was at Shechem when they come back into the land that they, uh, uh, between Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim, they, they dedicated themselves to keep the Mosaic Law. So Shechem is a very, very key geographic spot. And so this sacred spot is now uh, uh, reminding the Israelites of their divinely appointed destiny as a nation uh, if they're going to be faithful. And it came to pass when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who was yet in Egypt, remember he was in exile in Egypt because Solomon was trying to kill him, so he ran off to Egypt into Egypt's protection. When, uh, anyway, when he was yet in Egypt, he heard of it, for he was fled from the presence of the king Solomon, and jo, uh, Jeroboam dwelt in Egypt. Um, and, uh, but it's obviously he had spies that kept him posting what was going on. And he heard about the impending coronation of Rehoboam. That they sent and called him and Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came and spake unto Rehoboam saying. So they're gathering there for some comments. And it says, Thy father made our yoke grievous. 
Now therefore make thou the grievous, the grievous service of thy father and his heavy yoke which he put upon us lighter, and we will serve thee. And he said to them, Depart yet for three days and come again to me. And the people departed. So he's going to think it over. He's taking some time to consider this very strategic issue. And uh, so they plead for lower taxes during the coronation festivities. He's going to take it upon reflection. It's interesting that Jeroboam is speaking is their spokesman. That's sort of strange because he was, uh, he was uh, you know, alienated from Solomon. But he's, he's somewhat their spokesman and that itself is significant. Now you realize, if you refresh your memory here, Jeroboam, of course, had been told by the prophet Ahijah that the kingdom would be divided and that he would rule ten of the tribes. That was back in chapter 11, verse 31 and following. But he seems to have st be standing back to let events take their own course, at least at this stage. If, if Rehoboam would have reduced the taxes and so forth, at least for a while, it might have been uh, uh, a different history. But he takes these three days to think it over and then in uh, verse 6, And the king Rehoboam consulted with the old men that stood before Solomon his father while he yet lived, and said, How do ye advise that I may answer this, this people? And they spake on him, saying, If thou wilt be a servant to this, uh, th this people this day, and wilt serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them, then they will be thy servants forever. But he forsook the counsel of the old men. These are the guys that were, you know, the, the carryovers from Solomon's day. So he, he, for, he forsook their counsel. He says, which they had given him and consulted with the young men that were grown up with him and which stood before him. So he's turning to his own contemporaries now for their opinion. He said to them, what counsel give ye that ye, we may answer this people who have spoken to me saying, make the yoke which thy father did put upon us lighter. The young men that were grown up with him spake on them saying, Thus shalt thou speak unto these people that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make thou it lighter unto us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. And now whereas my father did lay, laid you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father has chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. Whew! So that's their advice. And uh, so the, uh, the uh, uh, poor advice, it turns out, obviously. And uh, it was just the, uh, the young men gave just the opposite uh, advice of the elders. But it was apparently what Rehoboam wanted to hear. And uh, so uh, he's going to give a, his reply to his petitioners, thus suggested by the younger advisors. And it's almost designed, it would seem, to provoke hostility that he'd be far more harsh than his father and so forth. His little finger thicker than his father's waist is, a, is a, a hyperbole intended to express his greater power. He's going to be uh, tougher. And uh, by the way, he was no child at this time. He was about 41, they estimate, from uh, chapter 14. Nor was his decision on the spur of the moment. He had three days to think it over. It was a deliberate choice on what he thought would be uh, the appropriate uh, response. Possibly the king thought and his counselors thought that intimidation would send the potential rebels scurrying uh, uh, for cover and uh, it would drive any ideas of insurrection away. Quite the contrary, it seems to have prompted them. By the way, this whip and scorpion thing, a whip was just a plain leather strap, but a scorpion was a term used for a whip with barbed metal points in it that was used to, uh, for the castigation of slaves. So Rehoboam and uh, all the people came to Rehoboam, excuse me, so Jeroboam and all the people Notice he seems to be the spokesman already for the discontent. <laughs> and all the people came to Rehoboam on the third day, as the king had appointed, saying, Come to me again the third day. And the king answered the people roughly and forsook the old men's counsel that they gave him and spake to them after the counsel of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, and I will add to your yoke. My father also chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. And wherefore the king hearkened not unto the people, for the cause was from the Lord, that he might perform his saying, which the Lord spake by Ahijah the Shilonite uh, unto Jeroboam the son of Nebat. Remember he got that prophecy from Ahijah just before, uh, uh, you know, in the last session. And so uh, even though this is a tide of circumstance, we see the Lord's hand in it. It's interesting, uh, I've been on th three interviews today uh, from various radio stations across the country, uh, you know, uh, uh, speculating about the, uh, uh, you know, 
the, the impending war with Iraq and so forth. And uh, it's interesting how there seems to be a consciousness that what's going on, you, you can give all kinds of reasons uh, why, we're, why, we're, why this is happening. But behind the scenes, what you don't see is there's a tide of events that may be moving in a prophetic way. I think the whole geopolitical landscape is going to be changing over the coming months and years. And uh, I think it's only when we see that the fog lift that we'll really understand that the real dynamics are, are, are a result of spiritual warfare. We get this clue from Daniel 10. But we see that same kind of flavor going on here in this, that there's a, there's a tide of spiritual uh, uh, moves that are really driving the rest of it. Let's go on to uh, picking up verse 16. So when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king saying, What portion have we in David? Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. Now see to thine own house, David. So Israel departed unto their tents. So uh, see, Rehoboam's in, uh, insensitivity extinguished any hopes, apparently, for uh, economic recovery. And uh, so... He alienated the subject and, and broke the union. This is breaking the union then of the 12 tribes. And uh, the, uh, the uh, destiny of the house of David seemed to be repudiated by the majority of Israel here. To your tents, O Israel. You may remember that was the same battle cry that Sheba used against David back in uh, 2 Samuel 20. And uh, so it, uh, it became their battle cry here. And with these words, of course, they turned their backs on the heritage to seek out new paths with a newly cho chosen leader, uh, Jeroboam, uh, the son of Nebat. And as for the children of Israel which dwelt in the cities of J Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. Now, the only people that stick with Rehoboam is his own tribe, the tribe of Judah. And that's going to be uh, uh, only his closest countrymen st st uh, stayed with him. Then King Rehoboam sent Adoram, which was over the tribute. and all. Now, <laughs> he... He has a gift for doing strange things. You know, first, he used this very intimidating language, which uh, obviously uh, backfired on him. And he picks this guy, Adoniram, or Adoram, it's a variant spelling of the Hebrew, uh, who was the personification of oppression. He was the foreman of the forced labor. And he uses him as the ambassador uh, to these rebels. Well, uh, uh, no surprise, uh, they uh, stoned him with stones and he died. Therefore, the king Rehoboam made speed to get him up to his chariot and flee to Jerusalem. Oh, he's Rehoboam himself escaped with his life, barely. Um, so he's, uh, he's, it's, it's, it, the tensions are starting, and they're going to get worse. So Israel rebelled against the house of David unto this day. The term Israel here being, uh, it's often used to be the whole nation. Here it's being used for the northern group of tribes, uh, or Ephraim and the, the surrounding ones. What should have been a glorious national celebration with the crowning of Rehoboam. Uh, turns, he, he, he ends up having to flee for his life. We have uh, uh, the, you know, God's own appointed uh, dynasty, the house of David, um, being rebelled against by the people. And, and uh, so it came, to, oops, now we're, let's talk a little about the divided kingdom because we're gonna, we're, at this point, we're going to be dealing with the northern and the southern kingdoms. Now, Rehoboam's folly, of course, the ill-advised expansion of excessive taxation is part of it. That becomes, of course, Jeroboam's opportunity. What's behind the scenes, though, it, was, it had been prophesied that Jeroboam would be. He was promised through, by the Lord through the prophet that he would be uh, uh, having this thing. It's interesting that uh, it wasn't his doing that caused it. It was Rehoboam's folly here that really pro provided the opportunity. But he then doesn't... He, he, he really blows it. He could have been... Um, he could have had an incredible destiny. But he establishes alternate, alternate uh, worship centers. We'll see why in a minute. And uh, Dan in the north and Bethel in the south. And the nation's going to be split into two. The northern kingdom under Jeroboam, which will be called Israel, the house of Israel. Not the nation, it's the house of Israel, the northern kingdom. And the southern kingdom called the house of Judah under Rehoboam. Now, we're going to find uh, Rehoboam will reign about 17 years, Jeroboam about 22 uh, but uh, uh, we're going to have a whole series of kings in each of these, and it'll get a little confusing because obviously they're not co-terminal. They, they each one have different lengths. But uh, we're going to go through four major kings in the house of Judah uh, in First Kings, and we're going to go through um, eight kings in the northern kingdom. Um, 
But I want you to notice that the house of Judah is one dynasty. It's still the Davidic dynasty. Uh, Israel will have a, a, a four, at least four dynasties. And we're going to go from about 931 B.C. when this split takes place to in the neighborhood of 848 B.C., about 83 years. And we're going to, in this chapter, look primarily at the careers of Rehoboam and Jeroboam. And uh, the succeeding chapters, of course, will deal with the rest. To give you a broader snapshot of what's coming, we're dealing with 1 Kings. And this, uh, uh, the house of uh, uh, Israel will go from bad to worse. Their kings will get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse until finally, uh, they will, uh, they'll, after 210 years, they will go into the Assyrian captivity. The house of Judah doesn't do much better. It goes from bad to worse with some exceptions. There are uh, uh, four conspicuous, probably eight in total, good kings among their string. of There's about 20 in each list. They will go into captivity, but they will come back from the captivity. Is the northern kingdom will get wiped out as an identity totally forever. And we'll talk more about that as we go, but that's the perspective. So the southern kingdom will last uh, a century longer than the, uh, the northern kingdom. You would think that the southern kingdom would learn from the northern kingdom's experience. As they go from bad to worse and the prophets keep preaching to the kings and they don't listen, it goes, finally gets judged. You would think that the house of Judah would learn from this. A few did, but not many. This is all echoes of Solomon's apostasy. The sins he planted get multiplied in his sons and, 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 and following. It's disturbing to realize that sin is contagious and sin multiplies. So anyway, let's get to verse 20. It came to pass when all Israel heard that Jeroboam was come again, that they sent and called him unto the congregation and made him king over all Israel. There was none that followed the house of David but the tribe of Judah only. Now that's a little complicated because part of both Benjamin and Simeon had been folded into that. So it's, it's, not, it's not as crisp as it may sound here. And when Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah with, with the tribe of Benjamin, a hundred and fourscore thousand chosen men which were warriors to fight against the house of Israel to bring the kingdom again to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. So he is going to go uh, try to fix all this with force. He's got 180,000 soldiers to, 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 who are going to fight their brothers in the Ten tribes to the north. So things look like they're heading for big trouble, but God still has his hand on this. The word of the Lord came to Shimei, the man of God. He's a prophet. You're going to notice all through the Chronicles here, of uh, the, the books of Kings and Chronicles, that uh, you're going to find two kinds of leaders, the kings, the rulers, and the prophets, that not always, but generally are primarily speaking to the kings. And the prophets were feared, even by the kings that didn't agree with them. They were, their, their, their authority was characterized by miracles and all kinds of strange goings on, but they were, they were recognized as the word of God on the one hand, and yet the kings didn't listen. They heard, but they didn't do. It didn't drive them to commitment, which is what it was all about. But anyway, the, so Shemi is one, the first of these that we're going to encounter here in this chapter. The man of God saying, Speak unto Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and unto all the house of Judah and Benjamin, and the remnant of the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord. There's that identity phrase. This is not just an opinion now. They are speaking on behalf of the creator of the universe. Thus saith the Lord, Ye shall not go up nor fight against your brethren and the children of Israel. Return every man to his house, for this thing is from me. They hearkened therefore unto the word of the Lord and returned to depart according to the word of the Lord. Give them credit. Uh, Rehoboam saluted and says, Yes, sir, and they went home. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in Mount Ephraim and dwelt therein and went out from thence and built Penuel. Now see, they, Shechem is where we had all this going on, but that's in the area of Ephraim. And uh, it's, in, it's technically in the northern kingdom. So the northern kingdom seceding, uh, obviously this is going to end up being the northern kingdom territory. Uh, Jeroboam naturally takes Shechem to be his, his uh, center because Jerusalem is still the, the going to be obviously uh, all the kings of Judah ruled from Jerusalem. We're going to have three different capitals in the north, as you'll see, because we're, later on we're going to, he's going to build Samaria, and we're also going to run into Terza. We, they're all within a few miles, all within seven miles of each other. And uh, 
So these three, Shechem, Samaria, and Terza will be the three capitals of the northern kingdom at various times. But you notice in this last verse, he also fortifies Peniel. And that's presumably to give him some protection from the uh, east and from the southeast, from, from other tribes, and of course also from, from the uh, tribe of Judah. So Jeroboam said his heart, now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. He's worried. See, he's not trusting the Lord here. He's starting to use his, you know, rely on his own counsel, so to speak. But he recognizes that since Jerusalem is the capital of the southern uh, tribes, and that's where the temple is, and that's where the worship is, he's got a problem. Because people, even though they may be loyal to him politically, they'll be going down there to worship, and he sees that as a threat to his rule. He's got to contrive some way to wean the people off the temple and, and the mosaic, mosaic Judaism, in effect. He says to himself, if these people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of the people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, the king of Judah. And they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, the king of Judah. So that's, that's the predicament as he perceives it. And uh, uh, it's, it, it's, uh, it's uh, again, uh, it, it's, it, it seems logical, and yet it is um, a major sin. He was divinely chosen by God. And he was given promises that his dynasty would continue and prosper if he obeyed the Lord. So rather than somehow trust the Lord, he, he uh, builds a whole counter um, approach that's going to not only destroy him, but it's going to cast the seeds for uh, uh, a handful of dynasties following. Twenty kings are going to rule in the northern kingdom. And not one of them is going to turn to the Lord. All, all because of, of the seeds he's planting in here. Instead of one stable dynasty, they're going to have several of these. This is, you can look at this, these verses right here as Jeroboam's first act of infidelity to Jehovah. Okay. So he has a heart of unbelief is really what we're seeing here. And when you have a heart of unbelief, you have something else that accompanies it. And that's fear of your personal safety. If you're trusting the Lord, you have no fear for your personal safety. You don't have to. You don't have to. He's in charge. But see, he doesn't trust the Lord and, and associate right with that, right up front. They're going to kill me and they're going to turn again and so forth. So whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Now, it's interesting, there are, scholars have different views of this. Some scholars, um, um, Albright and others, say that he was really just trying to create a substitute way of worshiping Jehovah. I don't buy that for reasons you'll see coming, but I want to share it because there are some scholars that sort of give him the benefit of doubt in a sense. I don't think so at all. I think these are throwbacks to the golden calf of Egypt. They're not, uh, it's just that simple. He is, he is bringing them to idolatry. In fact, he makes two of these. He's going to put one in the south part of his kingdom and up the north. He puts one in Bethel, which is close to the southern border of the northern kingdom. It's north of Jerusalem, but it's the southern part of their kingdom. And the other one uh, they put in Dan. And this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan. Now, in the map that we looked at previously, Dan is way up in the north. It's, it, it's, it almost becomes symptomatic or idiomatic of the, of the north. And Bethel is the southern part of the northern kingdom. It's just north of the northern border of Judah. And those are the two worship centers. And uh, they become infamous for that very reason. Now it's kind of interesting, just to look ahead a little bit, the tribe of Dan is the tribe through which idolatry first enters the land. But so is Bethel. Bethel is in Ephraim. It's interesting, when you get to the book of Revelation, you're going to discover that when the twelve tribes are there detailed in chapter 7, there's a tribe missing. The tribe of Dan doesn't appear. And there's much speculation about why and so forth. Part of the reason has to do with the fact that Dan was identified with the entrance of idolatry into the land. But what you'll also notice that many scholars miss is you don't find Ephraim either. It's there. It speaks of Manasseh and the house of Joseph. Well, if you take Manasseh from Joseph, what do you got left? Ephraim. So the Holy Spirit put Ephraim there, but it didn't use his name. In fact, if you study the scripture, there's 20 times the 12 tribes are listed in the scripture. You'll notice every time they are, the tribe of Dan gets the back of the hand. 
in subtle ways, the way the text is structured. There are, there are, there are, are genealogies where each tribe has gone through the genealogy, and when you get to Dan, Dan and others, they're not detailed. They're just little editorial things. If you watch, you get sensed to. The Holy Spirit singled them out. And uh, so, but let's move on. Uh, verse 31, And he made a house of high places, and made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not the sons of Levi. And that's a very key uh, verse. He not only made idolatrous worship places on high hills, on the high places that was against, by that way, that was specifically prohibited in the Torah for this very reason, because those high places are associated with, with the Canaanite uh, idolatry. But he made priests of the common people. See, there's a total departure here from the instruction that God gave through the Torah because that they were they were supposed to be only the sons of Levi. And we're going to what you're going to discover when you get to Chronicles makes it even clearer if you were a Levite, what did you do? You moved. You didn't hang around in this region. You got out of there because you were not politically correct anymore. So the Levites migrate to the south as do all those who want to be faithful to temple worship under the Torah. So people from all the different tribes that were faithful migrated south. The text doesn't say this, but you can easily, reasonably infer that if you were in the south and just had it to had it to hear, uh, uh, as far as the temple's concerned, you didn't you didn't relate to all of that. You wanted to go idol worship. Where would you move? Up north, where it's politically encouraged. You follow me? So this these two administrations cause a commingling of the tribes. The faithful go north. The uh, Excuse me, the faithful go south, the unfaithful, the idolaters move, migrate to some extent to the north. And uh, uh, to give you some perspective of this, um, and we see this, uh, it's all through the scripture, by the way, but uh, um, this, this false religious system that Jeroboam has engineered and, and implemented here had a dual effect on the nation. First of all, the, 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 there's this immigration pattern. Uh, the immigrants were, by the way, there were a significant number. At the time of the division of Judah, uh, it was a, at the time of the division, it was only able, you recall, to mobilize 180,000 men. But we're going to discover 18 years later, they're going to enter, Judah's army is going to enter the field with 400,000 men. What's the difference? Well, some growth in population, perhaps, but also it's, a, it's, it's more than a doubling. So it tells you that the migration was consequential. And uh, now a second impact of this false worship. Uh, was on the character of the northern kingdom because it's going to degenerate. The paganism is going to cause the character of the northern kingdom to degenerate and each succeeding king is going to continue the pattern. In the south, they also degenerate not as fast and there's an exception now and then. We'll, we'll, as we go through the south, we'll notice that there's the good guys show up every once in a while. Not so in the north. It's just a steady downward path. Uh, in the north... Um, there are 19 kings that were from nine different dynasties. And only eight of the kings died a natural death. Seven were assassinated, one was a suicide, and one was killed in battle. And one died of injuries, suffered a fall. And the last king, Hosea, simply disappeared in the captivity. We don't really know what happened to him. Um, the Bible says that they all, did, quote, did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, close quote. So with this kind of leadership, it's no wonder that the people themselves fall into Baal worship and all kinds of injustice and so forth. God keeps sending them prophets, but to no avail. They don't listen. Or they listen, but they don't do. By the way, while this is going on, they have material prosperity. It's not as if the northern kingdom was under a big depression or something. They had material prosperity for a while because they had strong rulers all the way up to Jeroboam II. Jeroboam II. And we're going to talk about Omri when we get there. He established the capital of Samaria, which it'll go to later here. But it's interesting that the northern kingdom disappears from history and only the families of the ten tribes that moved to the south kept their identity and kept the identity of the tribes alive. And we'll see that in the New Testament as well as the Old. Let's go to verse 32. And Jeroboam ordained a feast. He's, he's continued to design this substitute religion, but he's going to imitate Yom Kippur here in a sense. In, uh, Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month on the fifteenth day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah, and he offered upon an altar. So did he in Bethel, sacrificing to the calves that he had made, and he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. 
So he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel on the 15th day of the eighth month, even in the month which he had devised of his own heart and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel, he offered upon the altar burnt increase. It, 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 this is, he, he's doing it uh, exactly one month later than Judah, but again, it's the 15th. He's trying to build a, a similar kind of pattern, if you will. He's trying to create a festival that's better than Judah's, in a sense. So this, this, this feast is designed by Jeroboam. Uh, the feast in, in the south is designed by God. So there's a, obviously a meaningful difference there. So and he personally, it's interesting, he apparently personally set up these altars. So that's important. Well, let's get on. Let's get on to one of the strangest chapters in the Bible. There are people that study the Bible and they read chapter 13 and can't make head or tail of what's going on here. So be prepared for a very strange, this is the story of two prophets. Two prophets. Behold, there came a man of God. He's anonymous. We don't know his name. Behold, there came a, a, a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. Now, understand, this prophet is coming from Judah, but he's going to minister up north at this worship center of the north called Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. This young guy is going into foreign territory, and he gives a prophecy that is three centuries early. Josiah comes 300 years later, and uh, to, for somewhere between 290 to 360, depending on the different, different scholars of slightly different chronologies here, and I won't get into all here, that's not, that's not material. The point is, three centuries later, there is a king by, by the name of Josiah who comes and he kills the priests and men's bones are burned on the altar. This is what this young guy is saying. How do you think Jeroboam felt about that? The king is standing there, by the way, at Bethel. It isn't just, you know, he's the king, right? And this prophet comes and nails this, right? Now he's, he gave a sign the same day saying, This is the sign which the Lord hath spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. Now this is often a pattern in Scripture. A prophet will make a prophecy from, that's going way, way out there, but it'll include something locally to prove that he's really a prophet. You follow me? And so and it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar saying, lay hold on him. <laughs> and his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up so that he could not pull it in again to him. In other words, not only did it wither, he couldn't retract it. That must have impressed everybody. You know? um, <laughs> so he, 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 Jeroboam the king is ordering the arrest of this prophet <laughs> But he found out that God's authority is greater than Jeroboam's. That's the point that God is making here. And he could, he could paralyze Jeroboam and make him useless. And guess what? The altar was rent. Just like the prophet said, it's split. The altar was rent and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God and pray for me that my hand may be restored to me again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored to him again and became as it was before. If you were Jeroboam, do you think you'd be impressed? Do you think you'd be impressed enough to change your ways? You know, in the comfort of our seats here, looking back, we say, of course, if that was me, I would have learned from that and repented. Jeroboam did not. Did not. And uh, that's, uh, you know, he acknowledged God's power and, and, uh, uh, and so forth. He, he referred to but it's interesting, he says, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God. Uh-oh. You see, that's, that's, that's indicting there, isn't it? That's indicting. Now, his, his, this, uh, uh, the king said to the man of God, Come home with me and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. Now, this might have been the nature of an apology for attempting arrest, or it might be a device for uh, warding off some other more... Uh, you know, the, the softening the judgment that's coming, what have you. The man of God said unto the king, If thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so it was charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. In other words, he's instructed 
to not eat, not drink, and not go back the way he came. So far, this, this young man sounds like Daniel, doesn't he? I mean, that's a, you sort of almost can hear Daniel's style there, you know. Up yours, O king, no way, you know. So he went, uh, so he went another way and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. So far, so good, right? This young guy has done pretty well. He's obeyed the Lord up to this point. Now is when the story gets weird. And uh, we'll try to take it slowly so we can follow the logic here. Verse 11, now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel. This is a different guy, obviously. And notice where he's living. He's old, number one. Number two, he lives in Bethel. I don't know what kind of guy he is, but he's living in a strange place in Bethel. And his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. The words which he had spoken unto the king, them they told also to their father. And their father said to them, what way went he? For his sons had seen the way that the man of God went, which came from Judah. And he said to his son, saddle me an ass. So they saddled him the ass, and he rode thereon and went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak and said unto him, Art thou the man of God that came from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said unto him, Come home with me and eat bread. Well, what the king, with all his riches, could not accomplish a believer, I'm assuming he's a believer, but obviously not having the mind of the Spirit here, what the king could not accomplish, this believer did. See, the sons of the prophet told their father about the prophecy that had been made against Jeroboam. And uh, so, acting on their report, he went after him here. And uh, come home with me and eat bread. And the young man said, uh, I may not return with thee, nor go in with thee, neither will I eat bread, nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was said to me, By the word of the Lord, thou shalt eat no bread, nor drink water here, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. A repeat of what he told the king. He's telling the prophet. But notice what the prophet says in verse 18. He said unto him, I am a prophet also, as thou art. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house that he may eat bread and drink water. But there's a very key phrase here. But he lied unto him. So this old prophet lied to him. In fact, uh, he didn't say just saying the Lord spake to me. He uses a strange thing. You know, uh, uh, he sort of equivocates here. And the angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord and so forth. Trying to perhaps create more authority here or something. And uh, the angel, the messenger, which means messenger, by the way, was no, none other than his own sons. We can only surmise that this guy is motivated by his own self-interest. He wanted to curry finger, uh, favor with the king uh, because uh, you know, this, this is a very impolitic kind of uh, announcement by the young man. And so by hastening after the prophet from Judah and by deceiving him and giving him an invitation, uh, he might try to prove that, he'd been a, that he's an imposter. He's trying to break the, the, the credibility of, of, this, of this young man, apparently. And, uh, you know, there is, there is a practical lesson here. Because, well, let's, let's get and see what happens as a result of this. He cried unto the man of God that came up from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, for as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord, thou hast not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee, but camest back and hast eaten bread and drink water in this place of which the Lord did say to thee, Eat no bread and drink no water. Thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulcher of thy fathers. Now this is kind of strange. See, the old man who deceived him still is hearing from the Lord. By the way, uh, uh, I hope I did, maybe I missed a key verse here. Uh, he lied to him. So he went back with him and did eat bread in his house and drank water. So the young man believes this guy, goes back and, and uh, eats bread and, and, and drank water and so forth. He came to pass and sat at the table. The word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back. The old man is hearing now from the, from the Lord. And that strikes us as strange, but that happens in a number of places, uh, there are prophets who sinned that the Lord still speaks to. Jonah and Elijah being examples in their in their career. But thou camest back, and, he is, and because uh, 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 he cried to the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord. Now this is straight from the Lord through the old prophet. For as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord, and hast not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee, 
but camest back and has eaten bread and drunk water in the place of which the Lord did say unto thee, Eat no bread and drink no water. Thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulcher of thy fathers. That is a real blow to that culture. That you're not only going to die, but you're, you're, you are not going to be buried with your fathers. That That is uh, uh, intended to, to, uh, to uh, you know, uh, upset him. And uh, so the old man is announcing the fate of the younger prophet right then and there because the young prophet had disobeyed the Lord's command. So he won't be given an honorable burial. Now to, many, to us at first this seems awfully unfair. The young guy did pretty well. And this old man is the guy that caused him to stumble. And God communicates through the old man the young man's um, destiny and uh, for, for his, because of his disobedience. But part of the, our inability to fully appreciate this is we fail to understand the importance that God put upon the young man's mission. Because that announcement to Jeroboam was not just for Jeroboam, it was for the nation. And, and uh, it was essential when on assignment for the Lord that we uh, perform it faithfully. There are implications there that are, that are uh, deeper than may be on the surface. There are a lot of examples of this in Scripture. Moses, you may recall, at one time at the rock, he, he struck the rock with his stain and, and the water came and that was fine. Many years later, he's again they're out with, without water. And again, God says, you know, speak to the rock and it'll give you water. And Moses goes there and, and angrily hits the rock. You know, you, you and I think, gee, that's kind of trivial. I mean, God calls Moses, I, you know, I'm not mad at them. You let them think I'm mad at you. I'm mad at them. And because of that, you're not going to enter the promised land. What? Moses spent 40 years in Egypt, then 40 years on the backside of the desert, and then 40 years wandering the wilderness with one dream to enter the, 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 the promised land. God says, you'll see it from the hill, but you're not going to be able to go because you didn't do what I told you to. God means what he says and says what he means and expects obedience. The implications of that, the, the, he didn't tell him to strike the rocks, he said, speak to the rock. And it turns out that if he'd done what God says, it would have been a model of the first and second coming of Christ in some ways that are... Uh, we won't get into here. The point is, God may have purposes that are profound, and we shouldn't second guess the significance of that and compromise them. We should do God means what He says and, and, and says what He means. And uh, this young man did fine, but God told him not to eat and so forth, and He allowed this prophet to shift him off his mission. And that's one of the that's one of the disturbing. There's lots of lessons here. You can, you can actually make a list of 20 things that you learned from this chapter about prophets. But one of the main things that uh, points I'd like to make is that the advice of other men, even if they're Christian friends, should not be substituted for the clear call of the Lord. And uh, the scripture says many counselors wisdom and we need to listen to that. But when the God calls you and you know what God wants you to do, that should supersede. And it's a tough, it's a tough place to be, but you, got, and you obviously have to be sure that God is calling you. But uh, this is a very sobering event here. Now it goes on. It came to pass that after he'd eaten bread and after he had drunk, and they, that he saddled for him the ass to wit for the prophet whom he had brought back. And when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him. Now this was not just a an, a, an accident of wild game, because notice what happens. His carcass was cast in the way, the ass stood by it, and the lion also stood by the carcass. Notice what's happening here. The people that are watching are not attacked. The donkey is not attacked. The carcass is not being devoured. The lion killed it and is standing at attention alongside. Anyone, they, they clearly recognize that this was supernatural. This was a judgment. Behold, men passed by and saw the carcass cast in the way and the lion standing by the carcass and they came and told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt. And when the prophet that brought him back from the way heard thereof, he said, It is the man of God who was disobedient unto the word of the Lord. Therefore the Lord hath delivered him unto the lion which hath torn him and slain him according to the word of the Lord which he spake unto him. And he spake to his son saying, Saddle me the ass. And they saddled him. And he went and found his carcass cast in the way and the ass and the lion standing by the carcass. The lion had not eaten the carcass, nor torn the ass. And the prophet took up the carcass of the man. That took guts. <laughs> laid it on the ass and brought it back. And the old prophet came to the city to mourn and to bury him. And he laid his carcass in his own grave. And they mourned over him, saying, Alas, my brother. It came to pass after he had buried him that he spake unto his son, saying, When I am dead, 
Then bury me in the sepulcher wherein the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. For the saying which he cried by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the houses of the high places which are in the cities of Samaria surely shall come to pass. And after this thing, Jeroboam returned not from his evil way, but made again the lowest of the people, priests of the high places, whomsoever he would, he consecrated him, and he became uh, one of the priests of the high places. So despite all this, this strange episode, Jeroboam hasn't learned a thing. He continues doing the things that are offending God. Now, what you're not seeing here is a lot of the other things going on. Jeroboam did a lot of other things that are probably very positive, but not spiritually. As far as God is concerned, he's a loser. Big mistake. Now, as you go through this, uh, it's 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 uh, tough. It's tough going to try to sort this out because we find this so strange. The the prophet that was lying wasn't killed. The young man who didn't do his duty got killed, and the lying prophet, the old fella, is an instrument by God announcing the judgment. He obviously, he obviously, as he realized what was going on here, must have grieved. He may have gone through far more agony than we have capacity to imagine to realize that he was the fault, the fault of not only the young man's death, but also the, 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 uh, to, to be in God's way for what God was trying to do here. Uh, he, I don't think it was easy for him either. But, but part of us, uh, what, what the story really underscores, I believe, is the importance of consistent and complete obedience. And uh, added privilege gives added responsibility. And most of us have far more privileges than any of these people had. And we need to understand with that goes a, a, a responsibility, and uh, so the, uh, the the greater the, the young man had a greater responsibility than the old man, so he was punished more severely. And so, uh, okay, um, this thing became sin unto the house of Jeroboam, even to cut it off and to destroy it from the face uh, from off the face of the earth. So ends chapter thirteen. Well, one more chapter, and we'll get going here. At that time, Abijah the son of Jeroboam fell sick. And uh, the uh, don't uh, now this should not be confused with Rehoboam's son by the same name. By the way, they both had sons. <laughs> in, 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 Jer <clears throat> Jeroboam was just a son at this time. Jeroboam said to his wife, "Arise, I pray thee, disguise thyself that thou be not known to be the wife of Jeroboam, and get thee to Shiloh. Behold, there is Ahijah the prophet." which told me that I should be king over this people. Now, Ahijah was the guy that first told Jeroboam that he's going to you know, have this incredible opportunity. Now, Jeroboam's thinking here is pretty confused because if he's a prophet, do you think his wife's disguise is going to fool him? See, the whole, the whole ruse be, uh, betrays uh, unbelief. Uh, and Shiloh, by the way, was the sanctuary uh, in the previous dwelling place of the ark. The town now became the dwelling place of Ahijah, the prophet. So... And, and uh, so uh, the, the prediction of his coronation was back again in, in uh, chapter 11 we, from last time. And uh, so he tells his wife, uh, <laughs> take thee ten loaves and cracknels and a cruise of honey and go to him, and he shall tell thee what shall become of the child. Jeroboam's wife did so and arose and went to Shiloh and came to the house of Ahijah. But Ahijah could not see, for his eyes were set by reason of his age. So he's so old at this point, he can't see clearly, but he, he can see a lot more clearly than she has any idea. And the Lord said unto Ahijah, Behold, the wife of Jeroboam cometh to ask a thing of thee for a son, for he is sick. Thus and thus shalt thou say unto her, for it shall be when she cometh in, that she shall feign herself to be another woman. And it was so, when Ahijah heard the sound of her feet, she came in at the door, and he said, Come in, thou wife of Jeroboam. <laughs> <laughs> Why feignest thou thyself to be another? For I am sent to thee with heavy tidings. Ooh. Go tell Jeroboam, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, for as much as I exalted thee from among the people and made thee prince over my people Israel and rent the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it thee. And yet thou hast not been as my servant David, who kept my commandments, who followed me with all his heart to do that only which was right in mine eyes. But thou hast done evil above all that were before thee. For thou hast gone and made thee other gods and molten images to provoke me to anger and hast cast me behind thy back. Therefore, behold, I will bring evil upon the house of Jeroboam and I will cut off from Jeroboam him that pisseth against the wall and him that is shut up and left in Israel and will take away the remnant of the house of Jeroboam as a man taketh away dung till it all be gone. Can you imagine God talking to you that way? 
Him that pisses against the wall is a way of speaking of his male descendants. It may start, it's a strange idiom in our ears, and uh, it may be offensive to some of you. If so, I apologize, but that's the, you can see the text. That is, that is a faithful rendering of the Hebrew. And, uh, the, uh, uh, but can you imagine God recounting all the incredible things he's done for Jeroboam, but instead Jeroboam has gone out of his way to get God angry. So therefore I'll bring evil upon the house of Jeroboam and cut it off from Jeroboam and him that pisses against the wall and him that is shut up and left in Israel and will take away the remnant of the house of Jeroboam as a man taketh away dung till it all be gone. That's called cleaning house, man. Um, and him that dieth of Jeroboam in the city shall the dogs eat. And that's going to be literally true as we'll see later. And him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat for the Lord hath spoken it. Arise thou, this is the, the prophet now speaking on behalf of the Lord. Arise there, thou therefore, and get thee to thine own house. And when thy feet enter into the city, the child shall die. She came to find out what's going to happen to her son. Well, not only her son, all her sons. But, but uh, incidentally, as a footnote, the prophet says, by the way, your son's going to die when you cross the threshold. When you cross the city limits, he's over. So tough. that's a tough message. Tough, tough message. So she was disguised then discovered, and then doomed. And uh, tough, tough deal. See, God in verse 9 said that Jeroboam had done more evil than all who lived before him. That refrain is going to echo in the succeeding kings. Each one gets worse. And all Israel shall mourn for him and bury him, for he, for he only of Jeroboam shall come to the grave, because in him there is found some good thing toward the Lord God of Israel in the house of Jeroboam. Moreover, the Lord shall raise him up a king over Israel who shall cut off the house of Jeroboam that day. But what? Even now. And frankly, no one's quite sure, translators are quite sure what to make of that last part, except it's, it's a way of em emphasis. And in the Hebrew, it's a form of emphasis. In the translation, it suffers perhaps. For the Lord shall smite Israel as a reed is shaken in the water, and he shall root up Israel out of this good land which he gave to their fathers, and shall scatter them beyond the river because they have made their graves... Excuse me, made their groves, provoking God anger. Made their groves. What they're talking about here, on the high places, they would carve out of trees and so forth, phallic symbols. And they were uh, uh, part of the, the, the licentious worship of Ashtaroth and all that. So uh, they're very offensive. That's when you see the word groves, it's usually a translation of Ashtaroth or the Hebrew terms alluding to these phallic symbols. And he shall give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam who did sin and who made Israel to sin. And Jeroboam's wife arose and departed and came to Terza. And when she came to the threshold of the door, the child died. And they buried him, and all this Israel mourned for him according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by the hand of his servant Ahijah the prophet. And the rest of the acts of Jeroboam, how he warred, how he reigned, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel. And the days which Jeroboam reigned were two and twenty years, and he slept with his fathers. And Nadab his son reigned in his stead. And Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigned. And now we're shifting from the south to the north. Excuse me, from the north, we're shifting to the south. And Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigned in Judah. Rehoboam was 41 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord did choose out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. And his mother's name was Nama the Ammonitess. Notice, by the way, Rehoboam is part of the problem. Rehoboam was the son of a foreign wife. Solomon took foreign wives. One of these was uh, 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 Ammonite, uh, uh, Ammonite. And uh, uh, so you can sort of assume that the mother's influence, or lack thereof, either way you want to put it, uh, on Rehoboam is part of the problem. Part of the problem. So Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, which provoked him to jealousy with their sins, which they had committed above all that their fathers had done. They also built them high places and images and groves in every high hill and under every green tree. So there was idolatry of the south too. It wasn't the official... Uh, thing uh, like the north because they still had the temple and they still had the temple worship but they also had the, these other things going on so there, there were also sodomites in the land and they did according to the, all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the Israel, children of Israel referring of course to the days of Joshua and so on it came to pass in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that Shishak the king of Egypt came up against Jerusalem there's a lot of supplementary information by the way in all of this in Second Chronicles about chapter 13 and so forth but the accounts in 1 Kings are really more full and focus on the spiritual dimension with more intensity. But uh, anyway, we just shifted now to, to uh, 
uh, Rehoboam's uh, uh, thing to the south here. Um, there were sodomites in the land, and they did all according to the abomination of the nations which the Lord cast out before them. Does that sound familiar? See, the same practices which God had purged out of the, the, the moral cancer out of the land, uh, uh, they're, they're now bringing back in. The, the cancer that plagued them in Joshua's day are now coming back to haunt them. It came to pass in the fifth year of the king Rehoboam that Shishak, the king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. Now, this Shishak was realized was probably, he may have been the Solomon's father-in-law. Remember, he married the daughter of, of the Pharaoh, was one of his first foreign wives. Uh, this, this is probably Sheshank, uh, the first of the Egyptian records, the founder of the 22nd dynasty. But he is, he, whether he realizes it or not, he's an instrument in the hand of the Lord for punishing the national defection here. And this is the first serious foreign invasion of Israelite territory since the days of Saul. This is the Pharaoh that gave asylum to Jeroboam earlier. And uh, so in, Jeroboam, in Rehoboam's fifth year, he tried to establish uh, Egyptian supremacy over the whole region. His military campaign included Judah, Israel, Edom, Philistia, and netted him control of 156 cities. So this is no slouch. In the Temple of Karnak, the record of his campaigns is inscribed on the interior of Ammon's temple on the south wall in a relief freeze. And a briefer, more concise, sober account is given here in the Bible where it is honestly admitted that uh, Shishak despoiled the beautiful temple before he agreed not to pillage uh, Jerusalem fully. Um, and he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord, the treasures of the king's house, and he took away all, and he took away the shields of gold which Solomon made. But he doesn't plunder the city other than that. And the, the king Rehoboam made in their stead brazen shields and committed them into the hands of the chief of the guard, which kept the door of the king's house. And so it was so... When the king went in unto the house of the Lord, that the guard bare them, brought them back into the guard chamber. Now the rest of the acts of Rehoboam and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And uh, there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all their days. Rehoboam slept with his fathers and was buried in the, with his fathers in the city of David. His mother's name was Nama the Ammonitess, and Abijam his son reigned in his stead.